Good morning, everybody. Morning. Welcome to those online who's joining us. Um, for those in house, just a reminder to please keep the social distance and to the mask should stay on the face at all times, covering the mouth and the nose. Can we all stand and let's give God the worship and the honor He deserves? Amen. Into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, a bag of bones. And I tried with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a bag of
Because He healed my heart, He changed my name forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. Oh, I thank God. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God, what a happy day it was. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Rule of heaven and earth. Thank you, God. You make 
make a way where there seems to be no way. You are promise keep. You are faithful God. Worthy God, worthy God. You work on our behalf. Even though we cannot see it. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you even when I feel. Oh, you never stop, you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. suffering Lord we hold on to you Lord Jesus because you are at work you are at work Lord we trust you we believe in you Lord we love you Lord Jesus amen let's just stay in it 
moment of worship, and I want to ask you if you can just uh, to go grab communion elements on the side. Um, we're going to continue to worship by taking communion together, so there's communion on both sides. So if you can just go grab communion elements, we're going to worship together taking that. And if you're at home, uh, grab your communion elements. took some bread and he blessed it and he broke it into pieces and he gave it to all the disciples you know this morning as we're worshiping as we continue to live our lives while they were eating they stopped and they paused and I want to ask you this morning to just pause a bit to just stop and reflect as we're going to remember not someone who was dead but who rose again his body has been broken for us. So let's take the bread together and just pause and remember His goodness. And then he took the cup of wine and gave thanks to the Lord for it. He gave it to them saying, each of you drink from it. This is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Lord Jesus, we just want to give thanks this morning, Lord. We love you, God, and we honor you. We bless you. We thank you for this privilege, Lord, of your body that was broken for us. Your blood that was poured out for us, Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of sins to make right to make covenant with you Lord we thank you Lord that through this covenant nothing can separate us from the love of God we honor you Lord thank you for your blood let's take it together Jesus we honor you we love you we bless you we thank you Lord that we can do this again Lord not out of remembrance of someone who is dead, but someone who is alive. Someone who paid the price for our forgiveness. So we thank you this morning that we can just remember and celebrate with you, Lord. King Jesus. Thank you, God. Amen. tithes and offerings now and we want to encourage you to give to the body of Christ it's so exciting to be able to do that you know we so freely can be online we so freely can come to church with our families now with 50 people and it's so wonderful that God has been faithful he's been faithful in the little and he's been faithful in a lot and, and I just want to encourage you to just thank him for that we thank you Lord we thank you for your provision Father where we see that there is no way you make a way Lord and I want to read from Proverbs 3. It says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty. 
And I want to see this barn be filled with plenty. I don't know about you. And so I just want to encourage you to, as part of our worship, we're so privileged today. We get to worship, we get to do communion, and we get to give. Everything we have is His. And so we've got our snap scan on the screens. We've got all of our details at the bottom. I want to encourage you in-house. We're going to take up offering now. You can come up and give your offering. today online and in person to declare your name. I thank you, Father, that we are able to give to you what belongs back to you, Lord. I thank you that we get to show our appreciation in so many ways, Father, because you love us so much. You sent your son for us, and I pray that we remember that each and every day as we go out. Father, thank you that we can see our barn be filled, Father, and that we see the barns around us be filled, Lord. We just want to pray that. I pray for those um, online and here, Father, that you would just be their way maker, be their miracle worker in their lives, Father. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, church. I just want to say hello to a couple of people online. Uh, Kerry Ann, Shiksha, Di, Jonathan, Bernadette, Heather Davies, Margaret, Lee Canlish, Roger. We just want to welcome everyone online. We want to welcome you here. Thank you for coming to church today. If you are joining us for the very first time, um, why don't you just raise your hand um, if you are um, in the services or online. Will you just um, click the link that has been put there? Um, and we want to encourage you to just connect with us. We love new people. And so invite somebody to church. Um, click share online or give somebody a call and say, hey, I'm dragging you to church this morning with me. Um, and so we have lots of things coming up in the week because now we are um, allowing people to come through. Thank you, Mr. President, for that. Um, and so we've got our prayer meeting tomorrow night um, at 7 o'clock here at the church and online as well. And so we want to encourage you, if you want to come pray with us, please come pray with us. We're going to be chatting through the vaccine. Pastor Rulof's going to be chatting through a lot of details about that. And so um, I think in an uncertain time, it's great to have some certainty with your church family as well. So come through and join us for that. This afternoon, we've got our prayer walk with our reorder church community. We've been partnering together with a couple of our churches um, through prayer. And so we want to encourage you, go into your community and wear white and pray in your community over the government, over our country, over the people in your community, and over your families. Um, and so all of those prayer points are online and on our social media. And we want to encourage you today at 12 to 1, um, walk with us. We'll be in our communities, and we pray that you'll be in yours as well. We also have our prayer wall, which is happening on a Sunday evening, a Tuesday evening, and a Thursday evening from 6 to 6.30. So come through and just trust God for healing and restoration um, for those names being written on the wall. And um, we're just constantly trusting in Him always. We also have kids online straight after the service here, um, and we'd love to see your kids there. We've got children's ministry here. If you are here, your kids can go to children's ministry, which is really exciting. And we're just really encouraged by the fact that even though our church was closed, our building was closed, church still carries on which is super encouraging. Bryce, we have somebody special coming to preach today. Amen. <clears throat> Let's uh, give a warm welcome to our guest, Ed Ransomi. All the way from far, far away, Michalisburg. Um, he's coming to preach the word with us today, and so we're looking forward to it as we wrap up um, this series, uh, Caught in Chaos. I just want to pray for him, and then uh, he can fire away. Lord Jesus, we thank you for Ed. We thank you uh, just for the word you've given him, Lord, and we just thank you that you're going to bless us from your word today. Bless him as he preaches, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, oh, thank you, Bryce. Too kind. Probably the kindest I've ever heard Bryce speak to me. Um, it's great to be here again. I um, yeah, was here for the 8 o'clock, and uh, great to have all of you just joining in. It's, it's, it's a wonderful time. And um, where, is Nick still around, or is he gone? Is Nick somewhere nearby? Is he out? All right, no, I, okay, he can stay there. Um, 
No, I mean that nicely. <laughs> He's obviously busy doing something. Yeah, why don't you bring Nick in for a moment? This is just a special moment that I need to share with Nick. Because uh, one of the things that I do is, I, you know, do a whole range of different stuff. But every time now, every now and then, people invite me to come and speak uh, on around a subject that's become very close to us, and probably over as South Africans over the last few years. It's called cultural intelligence, right? Right there, yeah, thank you. Sit um, more And then I heard during the break, in between the services, that Nick's actually uh, Afrikaans. Is it right? What's your surname? I don't even know your surname. Oh, that's right. You're Afrikaans. Um, so when he shared that, that reminded me of something that happened to me many, many years ago. And uh, so I was in this, this kind of dorp uh, somewhere in the north, somewhere outside of Pretoria. So, so hearing all the Afrikaans made me kind of remember this. So I, I'm, I parked my car. I'm going to go meet a client or something at a local, I think it was Centurion Mall or somewhere, a place like that. And I walk out. And as I'm walking towards the meeting, I've got nothing. I literally got my, my phone, my wallet, my keys. I'm walking. And an old Afrikaans dame, by your otani. Nick, she starts waving her hands like this. Nye dankie, nye van dachni. And I, I mean, I know a little bit of Afrikaans. So I was like, whoa, what's going on? Why? I'm like a little bit scared. So I do what we do in South Africa. You know, I kind of break eye contact, don't look, you know, just look away. As I get closer, though, she gets louder, Nick. Nye dankie, nye van dachni. Which means what in English? I mean, can you do a quick translation? No, thank you. No, so I get closer and I look at her and I'm thinking, but I've got no, what is this woman going on about? And I then say in my best Afrikaans that I can find, I say, is Alice all right? <laughs> so she goes, no, thank you. No samosas today. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, if, if the only message I shared today with you, please, Barn Christian Fellowship, hear this. Just because you see Indian doesn't mean I'm here to sell stuff, please. But listen, Lonnie, if you're looking for some stuff afterwards, <laughs> you come speak to me there and we can hook you up. You've got some speakers, some sound. Keen? Yeah, we'll set it up afterwards. Thank you. But you can go back to whatever you were doing. <laughs> what were you doing, by the way? Um, uh, online, by the way. Did you tell everyone I say hi? Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I'm glad you did that this time. Sorry. Um, why was I even sharing that? I'll tell you why we're sharing that, because sometimes it's easy, right? If you've never heard someone speak before, or if you're in a new place, it's often good to try and remember those. And that's the beautiful thing for us as South Africans, is we can do that kind of stuff. We've got so many stories to share. And I think at a time like this, especially in our country, we need to be looking at the things that actually bring us together, rather help build us as a nation, rather than the things that divide. True? And so pray, pray like we've never prayed before. And so as you heard in the intro from Bryce, my name is Ed Ramsamy. I'm part of a ministry called the Luis Palau Association and one of their departments, which is the Global Network of Evangelists. Uh, we're all about traveling around the globe. God has really given us the opportunity to travel the globe, to just engage and identify, affirm, equip, and mobilize evangelists, people who are proclaiming the gospel. But we're part of an organization uh, that was headed up by Luis Palau. Now, Luis was... Uh, at one time, the Spanish translation for Billy Graham, who many of you will know, and almost 50 years ago started this great ministry to proclaim the good news, to unite the church, and impact cities worldwide. And so that's something we, we really, really excited about. Uh, it was a thrill in April this year to travel to Lus uh, Lusaka first, and then Livingston in Zambia um, with, with Bryce. Bryce was part of our team. In fact, the team was made up of about 23 evangelists from right across Africa, the U.S., and Europe, and so we were just thrilled to be there together. We got to hang out and just uh, do some crazy stuff in both Lusaka and Livingston. And if you want to know what some of those crazy things were, um, you can come speak to me after the service. I'll, I'll share all of the stuff that Bryce got up to. I'm Ray. Uh, if you want to know, just, just come ask me. Now, today I want to come and share God's Word with you, because it's such a great opportunity to be with you, whether you're watching online and following us, or if you're here in person. Uh, and it's so good to be back in person, right? Um, and thanks to the worship team as well for just leading us so passionately and deeply. Uh, I love that song, Waymaker. It, it is such a powerful declaration of the God we serve. So if you have your Bible in whatever format you've come with, uh, I still find whenever I come to preaching God's Word, good old school, hard copy, you can't go wrong, right? Uh, let me just see, by show of Bibles, how many of you have brought your hard copy with you to church? Well done, look at that, good and faithful servants of the Most High. You will go to heaven first. The, the, Right, and then how many of you guys have got devices? Pastor Peter, I see that hand. Oh, I mean, I see your device. Uh, how many of you have brought your Bibles on your devices? How many of you know that your Bible is on your device? Well, well done, man. Are you using the U version app? 
You like the, the hard copy? Nothing wrong with that. That's good. So well done. Whatever format you have, follow with us. Just the guys that are on their phones, though, please promise that you will be following the sermon and not tweeting or texting or Instagramming or, you know, no Instagram stories, please, while we're in church. Cool. So Mark chapter 4, it's a great passage of Scripture. Uh, when I got the invite to come and share with you, I, I was kind of told, hey, we're right in the middle of a series called Caught in Chaos. And so when I saw that, I remembered this, this passage of Scripture, and I've entitled today's message, When Storms Rage, Anchor Deep. When storms are raging around us, anchor deep. And that's the story that we see in Mark chapter 4 from verse 35. It says, that evening came, so when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. I mean, just that, past, just that part alone, they've just had this amazing day of ministry, they've been traveling around, Jesus has been teaching primarily through parables, and they get to this moment, and Jesus says, right, let's go over to the other side. And what I love about that, just that section, is Jesus was trying to encourage his disciples to get away as well, to take that time to rest and to kind of rejuvenate and ref- just rest, refresh, and before they would go back to do ministry. He says, let's go over to the other side, leaving the crowd behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him, a furious squall, verse 37, a furious squall, or a storm came up when the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was at the stern sleeping on a cushion, and the disciples woke him up and said, Lord, don't you care if we drown? He got up, he rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He then turned to his disciples and said, why are you so afraid? Do you still, do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? We're just going to look at those few verses from the Gospel of Mark this morning. And as we look at it, I'm reminded again that it takes place at the Sea of Galilee. Now, if you get the opportunity to go on one of those trips, when we get the opportunity again to travel, And you go and you stand there on the Sea of Galilee, you'll notice that it is a vast amount of water. It is a beautiful body of water. But as you look around, it's 166 square kilometers of water. You stand on the shoreline, you look across, and at certain parts, they say that sea can go down about 700 feet in depth. And then you look up to the north and you see Mount Hermon. Now, it is a beautiful mountain range all around that area. But Mount Hermon in particular just stands up above the rest because it's of its beauty, its majesty, and it is covered with snow. And every now and then, cold winds, cold winds coming off the mountain rushes down that mountain slope and goes, blows across the lake. The force of the cold air meeting the hot, moist air of that region collides and there's an explosion and it's often in the shape of a storm, the storm that the disciples in Jesus experience on this evening. So Jesus and his friends are in the middle of a storm. It's chaotic. They're freaking out. They're running around. They're trying to come up with ways to get through the storm. And what is Jesus doing? He's sleeping. And so in this text, this passage, there's so many lessons for us to learn this morning, friends. And here's the first one I want to start with, is that you and I can predict the storms. We've got amazing apps, and there's so much good technology today that can help us predict the storms. But here's the reality. You cannot control the storms when they come. So you can predict it, but you can't control it. And so you and I are right now, in fact, as a world right now, all of us, whether you're watching online and those of you in person, all of us are in the midst of a global pandemic right now that's disrupted our lives. Every area of our life is disrupted. Just yesterday, I was with some friends. We were doing a baby dedication. We were just, and again, it's, I said, everything's different. We're doing this baby dedication. One of the family says, hey, man, we've just had a grandchild that was born in New Zealand, but it's probably going to be about a year before we get to hold our grandson. Yes, we get to see him, and that's the wonder of technology, but until we get to hold him, and I thought in that moment, that's how much our world has disrupted, that those kind of beautiful moments have been paused. The way we do school has been disrupted. The way we do church has been disrupted, and so today, after a very long time, we're so good to be back, be back in person, be together, but those of you joining us online, it's, it's this community that we've created now, whether on different platforms, 
and it's impacted all of us in different ways. For some of you, it may be a financial disruption. Maybe because of what's happened with the pandemic since last year, it's been a financial storm. Maybe for some of us here this morning, it's been a health scare and a health issue. And for some that have got the disease and those of us that that have recovered, and unfortunately there are many who didn't, maybe there's still others here that you're swamped in the arena of relationships. So you're thinking this morning, as you sit there, maybe you're part of that group that's saying, my goodness, when is the storm going to end? Because some of us, we're sitting and we're thinking, it's wave after wave after wave. I get over the financial thing, then there's a health thing. I get over the health thing, and then this. When is it going to end? And then a few weeks ago, our country just got disrupted even more, and we all, let's be honest, we all, no matter how strong our faith is, all of us were left answering that question, God, where are you? Don't you care? And I think if we had to be brutally honest this morning, many of us, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or I'm not going to ask you to put it in the chat, but I'm going to ask that question of us because I've asked it of, my, of him, Lord, where are you? We pray, we seek you, we come before you. You are the way maker. We sing it so passionately. If I had to be brutally honest this morning, there are moments I'm like the disciples. I freak out. I get afraid. So Mark 4, 38 says, they, they, they come to Jesus, they wait, they go, Lord, don't you care? Don't you care that we, may, that we could drown? And so there's a fear that grips them. There's, in fact, when you look closely, the word that they use here is, it's a, it's a lot deeper than, than they were just afraid. No, no, the word actually in the original Greek implies that they were panicking. If I had to use more modern today's kind of language, they were freaking out, man. They were losing it. And how often have you and I been in that place? How often have you and I, when we, upon hearing the news or going through something that we've experienced, we freak out, we panic? Because panicking is it's different than just a normal emotion of fear that arises at a time of danger or of hurt or of pain. And I find this strange because there's a group of Fishermen, they were fishermen. They would have experienced this before. They would have grown up probably around the coastal towns surrounding the Sea of Galilee. So they would know what to expect. And here's the truth, friends. Even though we know what might come, even though what is coming, when you're in it, you do panic. So they start bailing out water. They start rowing like they've never rowed before. They start working the sails. They're doing everything they can. They simply couldn't overcome the storm on their own. And what I found interesting is that they saw Jesus' inactivity as a lack of compassion. Because they asked him, don't you care? Oh, friends, the one who cares the most was right there, and he was about to demonstrate it for them. They were worried. You see, panic, fear often leads to worry, and so we worry. Have you met people like that and worry about everything? You know them. You've probably seen them. They people that when it's too hot in the summertime, they worry that, you know, oh my goodness, it's so hot. And so we cover ourselves with, you know, with, with, okay, some of you cover yourselves with sunscreen and all those things. The rest of us, we just. And then when it's too cold, you complain. I mean, I've, I know people, when it's too hot, they moan about the hot. When it's too cold, they complain about the cold. You know, sometimes I'm wondering if God is in heaven just thinking, when are they ever going to be happy? See, they worry. But this whole thought of worry, I mean, it's, Jesus spends a bit of time talking about it in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, hey, how many of you can add an hour to your life by worrying? And, and then he probably shares one of them. I, you know, when I look at the Scripture, sometimes there's little verses that pop up that amaze me. They, all of it amazes me, but there's just a few that I'm kind of going, hey, why was that there? Here's what Jesus says, and you can go check it out. Matthew 6, he says to the guys gathered around him for this lesson, he says, hey, don't worry about tomorrow. Yeah, some of you remember that passage? Don't worry about tomorrow because what, tomorrow has enough worry of its own. And I'm thinking, wow, Jesus definitely has the gift of encouragement. Because he says, don't worry about tomorrow. And I'm going, that's great. Thank you, Jesus. Why? Because tomorrow has its own worries. But then he leans in and he tells his disciples and the guys gather, he says, hey, you know what? Because the one who created you, the one who cares for you, the one who's going to provide for you, man, don't you think he will? If he's going to provide for the birds of the air, if he's going to provide, you know, (laughs) and give the, the lilies of the field such beautiful splendor, who are you not to be cared for? And here's what Jesus was saying in that moment. 
Because if you go back to the Genesis story of creation, you'll notice that in everything, God cre- spoke the universe into existence. He said, let there be light, there was light. He said, let the waters separate from the earth, and it separated. But when it came to you and I as humanity, you know what the Bible says? It's a beautiful description. He said, he took the earth and he f- fashioned a man, and he said, let us create man in our image. And then he breathed that ruach, that spirit. He breathed into man and Adam was born. So don't you think, just for a moment, that if he spoke those things into existence and he cares so much for them, but he created you, don't you think that he would care for you even more? Now, I'm not saying that we mustn't be, you know, take care of the environment and I mustn't take care of animals. No, no, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that you and I are created in his image Why worry? Why worry? See, uh, when I was preparing for the sermon, I came across this little story that said, worry can be like fog. And when you look at a city, and sometimes those of us who have maybe driven, you know, whether you've been in the Cape or overseas, you drive through a city like this, and there's just fog settles in. And I remember one night in Cape Town, I couldn't even see the lights just on the car. I couldn't even see that. It was so dense. But if you look at that image for a moment, there's, there's this image of, that's, that's it's seven blocks long, and at some places it's about 100 feet deep, so that is really dense fog. But scientists tell us that if you take that fog or that volume of fog and you are able to convert it, you are able to change it into the liquid, you will probably be able to fill up a glass. Just think about that for a moment. Here's this fog. We look at it. It's seven blocks down. It's 100 feet deep. And we look at it and we go, oh my goodness, wow. But in reality, it's a glass of water. You see, what I'm trying to get at this morning, I think for all of us, and myself included as well, is that there are storms all around us that threaten to drown us and overwhelm us and destroy us. And sometimes we turn our eyes and we focus on that instead of focusing on his word and who he said he will be. Friends, we can't sing Waymaker, Miracle Worker. That is who you are. And then we become overwhelmed by the fog. So this morning, I want to share some encouraging words that I believe come out of this passage in Mark 4, because here's what happens. Jesus gets up, he rebukes the wind, he says to the waves, quiet, be still. Winds die down, and I love this next part, because for me, it's the language of hope. There was complete calm. Friends, those of us who are in the midst of a storm right now, There's that space between, there's that time between where we are freaking out, where we are panicking, where we are worried. Yes, those are human things to have. But we have a faith and a belief in one who will do the impossible for us. So you and I need to lean in and hear that. Because here's what Jesus, and he says those words that for me again, here's another text that I'm just like, wow. He says, where is your faith? Oh, he says, do you still have no faith? Well, I think another translation puts it, oh, you of little faith. And I got thinking about that, that there can actually be a range of how we trust God and how much faith we have in God. And so here's what Jesus is saying. And so the writer to the Hebrews picks up the same theme and says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So I wonder again this morning, how's your faith meter doing? I wonder this morning if our faith would be something that God would look and say, wow, wow. There's a great passage of Scripture, Mark chapter 2. It's the story of these friends who bring their paralyzed friend to Jesus. A group of them come to the house. It's in Capernaum, just along the seashore there. And and they just, they come and it's unbelievable. It is packed. There are people all over the house. There are people at the windows, people at the door. So these friends couldn't get their, their mate to Jesus. Now, what they do, I'm amazed, bro. That's a powerful story. They don't turn around and go back home. They don't just kind of go, oh man, you know what? Hey, we kind of missed it. We'll come back next time. We'll... No, no, these guys are going, yeah, you know what? We're going to do whatever it takes to get this guy to Jesus. Those of you know the story well, they break open a roof. Can you imagine for a moment the house owner? Just think about that poor guy for a moment. He's standing there. He's probably standing right next to Jesus, because I would, and he's probably waving at all the guys going, hey, did you notice Jesus? My house. Uh, that offering must have been amazing that day. 
because Jesus is there, and they look at it, and then suddenly the roof gives way, and a guy comes on it. And now for a moment, can you consider the guy who's lying on the mat? He's got no control over this. And he's being lowered, and everybody's kind of looking at him. All eyes are on him, and he's lowered to Jesus. And Jesus says, and, and I love this, Mark chapter 2, verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, son, your sins are forgiven. Guy gets up, wraps up his mat, and he walks out of that building. Friends, when Jesus sees your faith, what will he see? And so there's a, a couple of things that I want to share this morning with us because I really think that God has an amazing plan and purpose, but he's got some promises that are contained in his word that in the presence of the storm, right in the midst of the storm, one, he's, he's there with you and I. And so here's the first thing that I believe God's word calls us to. It's that in the times of storms, when storms are raging, anchor deep. When storms are raging, anchor deep. And as you anchor deep, there's some promises that you and I need to hold on. Here's promise number one. He's promised us his presence, friends. In the midst of the storm, as with the disciples, they're right in the midst of the storm. Jesus is there with them. He's present with them. So you and I need to hold on to that promise. You and I, as the prophet Isaiah reminds us in Isaiah 43, when you pass through the waters, he says, God says, I will be with you. When you pass through the fires, I will be with you. You will not be burnt. When you go through the rivers, they will not sweep over you, for I am with you. Friends, that presence, because he promised that to us in Matthew 28. He gives the great commission. He says, right, go, make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he makes this promise. He says, and surely I am with you even to the very end of the age. Yes, there'll be times where we don't feel it. But don't mistake his silence for his absence. And here's the thing, friends. God is silent. He's, he's given us his word. For all of scripture is inspired by God. And so he's present with us. Psalm 23, and I love this psalm. Oh man, I wish we, we had time. We could really dig deep into this because Psalm 23, there's that reminder again that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with, with me. Now, I know what many of us are thinking. Man, why can't he just remove us from the valley? Why can't he just not have a valley of death? Just a few days ago, I stood at the graveside with a dear friend and as he honored and respected and his wife of over 29 years, and he stood there and he said, you know, the one thing that as we journey through our life together, we were always aware of his presence. He says, and even now in the midst of all the pain and hurt of grief, I can hold on to that. You see, friends, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear because it's real. Yes, death is real, but it's not final. And our lives are not futile. And so in the midst of that, he says, I walk through the valley of shadow death and I'll fear an evil for you. Are, and maybe someone here this morning, maybe someone watching and listening online, maybe you need to hear those words that you feel as if you are overwhelmed by grief and sorrow and fear. He is with you every step of the way. Not only is he present, he is the great provider. He's Jireh. He's Jehovah Jireh, our provider, and friends, whatever your need, whatever it is you're looking for, he will provide, because as Jesus said, hey, how many of you as fathers, if your son asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? Now, I know what some of the dads are thinking. There are a few times where we want to do that, but Jesus says, how many of you, you will still, no matter how bad a dad, you will still give your son an egg. You will still give him bread and not a stone. You see, and our God provides he provides for our every need. And I, again, Paul writes and he says, for the, uh, he, <clears throat> but my God shall supply all. Man, and in recent months, that word all, just those three letters for me has become such a powerful reminder that my God, our God, your God will supply all our needs according to his riches that are in Christ Jesus. And again, for someone, that is a promise for you to hold on and anchor deep. And then, Go back to Psalm 23 for a moment. And I love this one. And the psalmist says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Talk about provision. 
And talk about provision at probably one of the hardest times. You're in the midst of your enemies, and yet God prepares a table. And I love the way Eugene Peterson put it in the message translation. He says, you prepare a steak meal. It's not just preparing a meal. It's preparing an unbelievable spread. It is saying, man, this is kind of, you know, it is the prime cut, maybe aged for like 21 days, you know, maybe Wagyu beef. I don't know when since Australia suddenly became good at me, but anyway, you know, maybe it's that and it's there and it's on your plate and it's been marinated with some, you know, all some herbs. And I know it's getting close to lunchtime, but bear with me. But listen to what he says. You prepare a table for me in the midst of my enemy. Wow. Talk about provision. Then in Matthew 6, when Jesus taught us to pray, he taught us to pray this. He said, give us this day our daily bread. Every day God has bread in store for us. Give us this day our daily bread. So he's a God who provides. He's a God who protects. He's a God who is present. He's a God who is, number three, powerful. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus said, therefore you go. And so there's that power that he's given us. And the, the disciples in Mark 4, the passage we're looking at this morning, in verse 40, they, they kind of look at each other and they go, hey, who is this? Who is this guy that even the winds and the waves obey him? Wow. You see, friends, a lot of people question God. They go, God, if you are all powerful, then why this? Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, or I'm not going to ask you to acknowledge it in the chat, but I, I, wonder, I wonder how many of us have got to that moment where we've questioned it, where we've said, God, if you are all-powerful, if you are the way maker, miracle work, then why COVID? God, if you are all of that, then why did our country have to experience what we experienced, especially in KZN and up here in Gauteng? Why did we have to go through that, Lord? Why did lives have to be lost? Why did people have to be injured? Why? And so many of us are left asking that question, why? Friends, I don't have a definitive answer, but you know what? The one thing I know, that as we are going through all of that, he will never remove us from it, but he will be present with us. And he will provide, and he will give his power. In us. Uh, many years ago, I was at a kid's birthday party. Uh, I took my son, his mate was having a birthday, and so we kind of all got there. And one of the other, and, and this normally happens, Right? All the dads, we kind of stand off to one side and, you know, we start sharing and maybe talking about the rugby and, you know, obviously, you know, Springboks, are, yeah, did they win? Yeah. So I'm, we, I don't really follow rugby, so I'm not sure what, what goes on. But um, I know that there was a lot of excitement earlier, even Peter. I mean, that's probably the most excited I ever saw you. I mean, he, he's like, the Springboks. I was like, okay, cool. Um, sorry, that stuff's lost on me. I really am sorry. But we would talk about rugby or something that's coming up, you know, and everyone's kind of got their drink in their hand and everyone's chatting. And then the typical guy thing, right? We guys do this. Hey, so, uh, hi, my name is this. And, uh, so what do you do? We always follow. Have you noticed? My name, what do you do? And then the guys will kind of, I work for Celsius and I work for this, but I work for, you know, I'm at MTN or I'm, you know. And I remember that at that particular time period, I was at a church, uh, Liberty Church in Discovery down the road here. And, <laughs> and I'd say, I'm a pastor. Now, one of two things would happen to the conversation. Either it would kind of like suddenly get very quiet, and, and it was amazing. I was amazing. What the, and suddenly the beers would go behind their back, <laughs> or they'd stop swearing, or they would lean in. They would start either, either kind of questioning, you know, why do you guys always ask for money? Or, like this one time, this guy leans in and he says, I'm so glad <laughs> that there's a pastor. I've had this one question about God. I think the way he put it is the man upstairs. I don't know why, but anyway, yeah. He says, I said, okay, cool. What's your question? He said, why does a, and he used these words. I'll never forget. He's a good God, which I thought it would be off to a good start. A good God let bad things happen to people. Any of you been asked that question by some of your non-Christian friends and non-believers? Yeah? Well, and here I am. I'm standing. We're at this kid's birthday party. The rest of the dads and I disappeared because they're thinking, this is far too deep. You know, this is a Saturday afternoon, for goodness sake. Um, and, so they leave, but it's just me and this guy. And I look over and I see my son and his son playing, you know, on the jungle bar. And while they're on the jungle gym and the monkey bars, and they're kind of, you know, doing boy things and they're flipping around and jumping and doing all sorts. And I look at him and I said, mate, you love your son, don't you? More than anything, yes. I said, I've seen you. You would protect your boy. Yes. You are protective, you are kind, you're always there. You're one of those few dads that's always present at every soccer game and every kicker game, and you're there, you're shouting you know, at the coach normally, but anyway, you're there. 
And I said, but we're about 20, 30 meters away from the boys right now. And let's just say, one of the other kids was playing there earlier, and they messed on you know, their sippy cup. The juice went all over the monkey bars. And, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff. There. And your boy's swinging from one bar to the next, and he grabs onto that monkey, and it's all slippery from the kid before, and he slips off, but there's this concrete slab at the bottom, and he falls, and he bangs his head, and he's dead. So you have to be quite descriptive when you're trying to make... And this guy looks at me, he goes, what's wrong with you? I said, no, 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 I'm just saying, hypothetical, I'm wishing, I'm just saying. And I asked him this question, because I really believe, I was inspired by the Holy Spirit in a moment, I looked at him and I said, mate, does that change the fact that you love your son? Does that change the fact that you're a good father? Does that change the fact that you actually wanted the very best for your son and you wanted to protect him at all times? Yes. You see, friends, God is who he is and his character never changes because of what we go through. He never stopped. He never said he'll stop the storm for us. He never said he'll stop death for us. He never said that, but what he did promise was his presence, his power, his provision. And finally, he promised us his peace. And the last few weeks, that's what we've been praying for as a people, haven't we? We've been praying, saying, God, we need that. We need peace to rule over our hearts and over our nation and the nations of the world. Lord, we need you to come. And there again, the prophet Isaiah again reminds us, Isaiah 9 verse 6, this is not just a Christmas time verse. This is an all time right verse. He says, Christ is our prince of peace. He's promised. And then Paul writes to the church in Philippi and he says to them, may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, because we can't rationalize it in our minds, guard your hearts, and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we need that peace. We need that peace to transcend in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of us being caught in whatever we are facing. Friends, we need to remember that. And so friends, I want to encourage us this morning, whether you, right now, as you listen from wherever you are joining us, and to those of us that are gathered here in person, I'm so grateful for that. As you anchor deep, may you continue to pray. May we continue to pray. Pray faithfully, pray eagerly. And this is what I've loved about not just your church, but I think the churches in our community that are gathering online and in person to pray. I want to encourage you, go, go join those prayer walks today. Go and be present. Come tomorrow evening. Come do, either you can log on or come in person. Let's be a praying people. But when God's people pray, things happen. Keep on believing. Keep on holding on to that faith. You know, we sing it so passionately. Let's live it. Let's believe it. Let's believe it to our core. And when you believe something to your core, friends, it will start being seen in your actions. And then keep on trusting him. You see, the disciples kind of freak out because they had seen Jesus do some miraculous stuff. Feed thousands, heal people, set people free. And yet, even in the midst of them having experienced that, having seen that, having been there, they still, in that moment of the storm, they still freak out. See, even in that moment, they didn't trust. I was chatting to Calvin during the week, and he reminded me that, I think a little while ago, he had preached out of Matthew, where Peter, this time, Jesus, again, they're on the Sea of Galilee, he's, Peter sees Jesus walking on the water towards them, and Peter says, hey, Lord, can I come to you? He says, yeah, come. Peter gets out and he's now suddenly walking on water. I mean, how cool would that experience be? But what happened is Peter shifted his focus. He took his eyes off Jesus and he looked at the waves. He looked at the winds. They do it again. And they do it to a point where Jesus then stands up and says, hey, where is your faith? And I wonder this morning if Jesus was standing here and saying to you and saying to me, Whatever storms you may be encountering, and I know for many of us there are storms, not just the COVID global pandemic, not just the loss of a job, the hurt of people that are not well. I wonder this morning, Jesus was saying, ask you that question, hey, why do you still have such little faith? Would you trust him? Because I remember growing up in a local church and uh, we used to sing this hymn. I, I loved it. And just the chorus, I just remember the chorus. And it went like this, trust and obey, for there's no other way but to be happy in Jesus. Trust and obey. 
And so let me encourage you that this, this morning, that if you are going, you're in the midst of a storm, or you're anticipating there's a storm coming, or something's about to happen, will you trust? Will you anchor deep? Will you anchor deep by remembering that he's made the promise to be present, to provide, to protect, to give us his peace, which transcends all understanding. So let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful, grateful for your word, grateful that every time we get together like this, and so grateful that we can gather in person right now. But thank you also for great platforms online that we could also join in and be able to worship and hear from your word. And so Father, I just pray, I pray for those of us that are in the midst of a storm, for those of us who are needing to make life-changing decisions and plans and Lord, I pray that we would always, whatever our plans are, whatever our steps are you, that we will come to you. We'll ask you to guide us and direct us, Lord. So, Lord, this morning, I'm going to pray for especially for those who need provision, Lord. Those who are just eagerly waiting for you to provide whatever that need may be. Maybe a physical need, maybe a financial need, maybe a health need. Holy Spirit, you know that which we need. You are Jairus. You are more than enough, and you will provide. But help us to trust. Help us to obey, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.